Thank you and welcome everyone. My name is Emily Gutman. Welcome to the BVSD Neurodiversity Training. Before we start, I wanted to introduce myself and my connection to this work. I am in my sixth year serving as a speech language pathologist in BVSD. I collaborate closely with students, families, staff, and the local community to establish enduring and secure relationships, aiming to provide support for a diverse range of learners and their unique cognitive needs. All of our presenters today have a personal connection to the concepts in this training and are sharing this training that was created in partnership with our community to improve our practices on behalf of BVSD students. And so, I am here first to say thank you for all that you do for our kids and second to talk to you about neurodiversity. So why neurodiversity? Because there are kids who are struggling and those struggles are often missed or misunderstood. But once you start to use a neurodiversity lens, you can see which kids are struggling, understand why they are struggling, and know how to support them. So let's see how that translates into today's training objectives. We have two objectives. First, understanding. We're going to be able to recognize that because everyone experiences the world differently, a student can believe they are unsafe under the same conditions in which we believe we are safe. And second, support. We're going to be able to apply a neurodiversity lens and the five-step model, more on that later in the training, to connect with students and identify the root of their struggles in order to support them in the school environment. And here is how we are going to achieve those objectives. We're going to start with a short grounding exercise to get ourselves centered and present. Then we will have two main parts to the training which will match up with the objectives. First, we're going to discuss neurodiversity by exploring its definition and models, and also how it implicates behavior, mental health, and masking. And second, we're going to apply those concepts through a five-step model designed to help you connect with your students and identify the support they need. As we go through the training, there are three themes that will come up over and over again. We are talking about everyone, not just kids with behavioral issues or diagnoses, not just kids with IEPs or who are in special ed. We're talking about all of your students and actually everyone else too. We all experience the world differently. I hope that as we go through this training, you'll start to see that everyone around you is experiencing the world differently from you. Not better or worse, right or wrong, just differently. And finally, safety underlies everything. Your students are either feeling safe or they are feeling unsafe, and that impacts everything about their school experience. So let's get started. As I said, we're going to start with a short grounding exercise. If you are comfortable, please go ahead and close your eyes. We are going to start by synchronizing our breath with some square breathing, or if you prefer a different type of breathing exercise, that's fine too. Square breathing simply means breathing in for four counts, holding for four counts, breathing out for four counts, and holding for four counts. Let's do the first one together. Breathe in. Hold. Breathe out. Hold. Now, please go ahead and continue at your own pace. As you breathe, start to notice your body. Are there areas of tension? Are there areas that are relaxed? Now start to notice what emotions you're feeling. Do you feel comfortable, calm, motivated, or anything else? Now start to notice any thoughts or beliefs you may be having. Are you liking that, this activity so far? Do you consider this a safe space? Do you feel like you can be your true self here? Now reflect on your environment. What do you feel against your skin? What can you hear? Do you hear my voice? Do you sense other voices around you? And lastly, what do you need right now? Maybe you need to continue this activity. Maybe you need some more coffee. Let's take a couple more breaths. And as we wrap up, when you're ready, please go ahead and open your eyes and return to this space. The purpose of this exercise is to help us feel grounded, which allows us to feel safe. If we are going to help our kids feel safe, 
we first have to feel safe ourselves. So now that we're more grounded, let's start talking about neurodiversity. If you've never heard of neurodiversity before, don't worry, you're in the right place. If you have heard of neurodiversity, you may find that we'll be talking about it in a different way today. Either way, in order to learn how to use a neurodiversity lens, we have to start by looking inward, which incidentally is exactly what we did in the grounding exercise. We reflected on what our bodies were doing, how we were feeling, what beliefs or thoughts we were having, how we were experiencing our environment, and what we needed. I suspect that no two people in your room answered all the questions I asked in the exact same way. That is neurodiversity. Neurodiversity is the concept that everyone experiences the world in a unique way. So simply put, neurodiversity includes everyone. Let's explore other ways you all may experience the world differently. Would everyone please raise their hand? Great! I can see that some of you raised your right hand while others raised their left. Right versus left hand dominance is an example of neurodiversity. Let's do another example. If I were to cook you something and I wanted to know how spicy you'd like it on a scale from one to five, where one is the least spicy and five is the most, who would say one? Two, three, four, any fives out there? The different ways we experience taste is another example of neurodiversity. There are some other ways I know I experience the world differently. I have an uncanny ability to immediately forget very important information I am told. My brain also thinks and processes information musically at warp speed and non-linearly, which can make it difficult for others who do not think in the same way to keep up with my thoughts in a conversation. I invite you all during and after this training to reflect on the ways that you experience the world differently from other people. Hi, my name is Ren and I'm an ADHD or Autistic and ADHD teacher. I am currently at Centaurus High School where I lead the Autism Intensive Learning Center. I'm going to share with you some models of neurodiversity. Reflecting on how we all experience the world differently is at the heart of how we are talking about neurodiversity today. But that is not the only way people talk about neurodiversity. Let's take a look at the different models. Under the medical model, there are neurotypical people and there are neurodivergent people. You're either typical or you somehow diverge from what's typical because you are disordered. Neurodivergent people are those who have neurodevelopmental disorders like autism spectrum disorders, ADHD, OCD, giftedness, Tourette syndrome, dyslexia, or others. Neurotypical people are everyone else. Under this model, neurodiversity is characterized in terms of deficits. So under the medical model, you might say that I have non-24 disorder, a medical condition marked by an internal clock that significantly differs from the 24-hour clock we operate on. You might focus on my challenges, like how I find it incredibly difficult to fall asleep or wake up at the expected times. Another model that many people use is the economic model. Under this model, instead of valuing people based on how normal or typical they are, value is strictly based on productivity. For example, you may hear someone say that the unemployment rate for autistic people is as high as 90% because autistic people lack the soft skills to make it in the workplace. Or you may hear something that sounds positive like companies should hire more autistic job applicants because they are actually good at math. But both of these models are flawed because they put a value on people based on how they compare to a typical person based on values important to a typical person in a society designed for a typical person. And they blame people if they can't live up to those standards. This is in contrast to how we earlier described neurodiversity as referring to the fact that every single person experiences the world differently. There is no typical or atypical, no normal or abnormal, no good or bad, right or wrong. We simply all are who we are. Like if I have green eyes and you have blue eyes, there is no normal eye color, no better eye color, and no worse eye color. Fortunately, there is a third model called the social model. Under the social model, traits are inherently neutral, not strengths or weaknesses. And instead of traits, we focus more on people's experiences and recognize that people's experiences are highly dependent on their environment. So for example, people used to judge how inherently normal or productive others were based on their race or ethnicity or religion or sex. 
Now many of us are aware that those attitudes are wrong, that success and suffering depend a lot on the way society treats you based on your race, ethnicity, religion, or sex. Another example, historically the term homosexuality used to be listed as a mental disorder as a specific identification in the DSM diagnostic manual. But now we are more aware that just because you're different doesn't make you disordered. The same is true for neurotypes or how you experience the world. That's why it's important not to see people's differences as good or bad, but instead focus on shaping our society, our environments, our homes, and our schools in ways that align with the different ways we experience so that everyone can succeed. And that's also why we have to talk about our next topics, behavior, mental health, and masking. As a person with sensory processing differences, I experience the world differently than most people. Some noises cause me physical pain. Some textures are so unpleasant that it's all I can think about if I touch them. Like, my whole team knows I don't touch clay. Sometimes the sensorial experiences of different spaces can make me anxious or scared without a reason for it. Sometimes I just feel unwelcome or uncomfortable in a space that most people feel just fine in. To help explore this, let's take a quick poll. If I could wave my magic wand and tomorrow you could spend the day wherever you wanted, where would you spend it? I'm going to give you some options and you can raise your hand for as many as you like. So, who would spend time outdoors? Maybe up in the mountains, hiking, skiing, or on the water. Who would spend time around town? Maybe getting a massage or getting your nails done, go out for dinner with friends, or walk around Pearl Street. Who would spend time in their house? Maybe binge watching your favorite show or spending time in the garden, or maybe catching up with a friend on the phone or treating yourself to a hot bath. Who would spend time in this building? You can do whatever you want in this building. Take a look around you. I suspect that if I did this exercise with a room full of your students, they would answer the same way. Humans are not designed to spend their whole days in buildings, in rooms, in chairs, at desks. We just aren't. And so although we are talking a lot about everyone being different, don't forget that your students, all of you, and everyone else are also in some ways very much alike. This is really important for when you see a student struggling. When you see one kid struggling, whatever the cause, it's likely that other kids are feeling it too. Let's say a student is shutting down or getting really agitated in the lunchroom. Maybe they are more sensitive to the smells or to the noise or to the amount of people or something else. Those are all things that are probably affecting all the kids. And although only one may be showing the effects, that doesn't mean the others aren't feeling it too. The same is true for me. When I say I prefer being in some places over being in others, this is not what makes me different from most of you. What makes me different is that I often experience that discomfort more strongly. For example, being filmed in this space at my job makes me feel weird. Right now, I can feel my body going into fight or flight mode. I volunteered to do this, but I'd really like to be anywhere but here right now. That's what happens when we feel like we are in unsafe environments. We prepare to fight back against the environment or run away from it. There is also freeze, staying still, hoping the threat will not notice you and move on, and fawn, trying to please or appease the source of danger so it may decide not to hurt you. We all experience these sometimes. So do our students. A student may feel unsafe and engage in a fight behavior by raising their voice at you or a flight behavior by running away from you on the playground or leaving the classroom, or a freeze behavior by not responding when you call their name, or a fawn behavior by going out of their way to please you in hopes of getting your approval. Behaviors are communication. When a student engages in fight, flight, freeze, or fawn behaviors, they are trying to tell us, I feel unsafe. When a student engages in those behaviors often, they are trying to tell us, I feel unsafe, all the time. That is the autistic experience. Our autistic students are trying to tell us, I always feel unsafe. Please help me feel safe. But what do I mean by safety? What do our students mean by safety? Let's talk about two types, physical safety and social safety. Physical safety is the type of safety that probably most readily comes to mind. It has to do with external risks, like fire, violence, falling, or also internal risks, like illness, hunger, fatigue. 
Social safety is more hidden and often overlooked. Social safety has to do with safety in your relationships, in your community, in your society. Do you feel accepted? Do you feel heard, seen, understood? Do you feel cared for? Do you feel comfortable with the expectations that are put on you? And most of all, if you are feeling physically unsafe, do you feel that someone would help you? That's why it's important to hear these behaviors as calls for safety, because even if all you do is help a student open up and allow them to truly be seen and heard, that may not change anything about their sense of physical safety, but it can change everything in relation to their social safety, which is something that they are also looking for. It's also important to hear these behaviors as calls for safety, because when we don't, the results are dire. And I am now referring to autistic people because much of the research in this area focuses on people with autism diagnoses. Autistics are more likely to struggle with mental health. 75% of autistic kids have a separate mental health diagnosis as compared to about 20% of the children in the general population. Autistics are more likely to become victims. 90% of autistic women have been victims of sexual violence as compared to 30% of women in the general population. And 70% of those autistic women were victimized before age 18. And autistics are more likely to kill themselves. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for autistic people. In particular, autistic children are 28 times more likely than non-autistic children to think about or try suicide. As a result, the average life expectancy for autistic people is just 54 years old. Once you see that autistic people feel unsafe, these statistics are not surprising. But unfortunately, that's not the worst of it. These statistics relate to people who feel unsafe and engage in fight, flight, freeze, or fawn behaviors. But people, including students, can feel unsafe and actually not engage in any of those behavior. I have felt unsafe for much of my life, including in everyday situations, in situations that I volunteered for, such as recording the video you are now watching. As I said before, my body feels unsafe right now, but I am not fighting, fleeing, freezing, or fawning. So let's add a fifth F, fake. The only reason you may not realize that I feel unsafe right now is because I have spent my entire life learning how to hide it. I learned that everywhere, at home, in the media, in school. In school, I learned that if I felt unsafe, I was not allowed to show those feelings. In school, I learned that if I felt unsafe, I was not allowed to engage in fight behaviors, flight behaviors, freeze behaviors, and that, as a woman, my fawning behaviors were desirable even if they didn't feel good. So instead, if I was feeling unsafe, I learned how to fake that my body felt safe even though it didn't, and that's called masking. You may have heard the term masking in the context of autistic people, but masking is something that many people do at least some of the time. Like when we pretend we're more knowledgeable than we really are, or when we act differently with our boss than we do with our family. It takes a lot of energy to feel one way, but give a different impression to the rest of the world. If you do it sometimes, it can be manageable. But what if you do it all the time? Think, for instance, about queer people. We're probably all familiar with the idea of being in the closet or being closeted. The fact that many queer people have had to constantly fake being straight in order to avoid discrimination and violence. That's the same thing as what we're talking about here. I have masked my entire life. I never had any behavioral or academic red flags, and I have excelled in both school and in my career. And I should say that my success through masking was also the result of two things. One, that my way of experiencing the world is a difference that can be masked, something that is not true as to the other types of differences, such as race or sex or visible disabilities. And two, I have other characteristics that are privileged in our society, such as being a white person with a lot of education and economic mobility. But the constant masking was both a blessing and a curse. I was able to succeed, but at great cost to my physical and mental health. I have struggled my entire life with depression, anxiety, insomnia, dissociation, GI issues, muscular and joint pain, and yes, even suicidal ideation. But you don't need to worry, I'm doing a lot better now that I'm not masking as much and I'm talking more openly about this. 
but my experience is not unique. Maskers experience higher stress, anxiety, exhaustion, and burnout. They also experience more depression, lack of identity, and self-loathing. Part of the problem is they are less likely to get any support because Nobody can see that they are actually suffering, and oftentimes they themselves don't even realize it. As a result, autistic people who mask have higher rates of substance abuse and suicidality than autistic people who don't mask. I bet there are students in your school whom you do not realize are masking every single day. And what you can't hear them saying is, I feel unsafe all the time. Please help me. So how can we help them? How can we tell if someone is masking? Sometimes you can't, but here are some clues. If a student seems tired a lot of the time, acts significantly different at home than at school, seems to be trying to mimic or mirror other students, seems to have a rehearsed script for situations, seems very consistent except for rare, seemingly unexplainable exceptions, or if something is off and you can't quite put your finger on it, and keep an eye out specifically for girls and students with high IQs. On average, we mask more often and we mask more effectively. Okay, that wraps up our discussion of neurodiversity. Uh, before we move on to the application, let's take a couple minutes for reflection and feedback. What has stood out for you so far in this training? Okay, great. Now that we understand behaviors, feelings, safety, and the environment through a neurodiversity lens, let's get to the application. My name is Jace Kinney, and my connection to this work is that I'm autistic and I volunteer and do the after school program at Fireside. And I wanna teach people in the community about neurodiversity. I'm also a BVSD alumni from Monarch K-8 and Monarch High School. I put on the screen the five steps we recommend for identifying, understanding, and supporting students who are struggling. It has been adapted from principles of cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, and mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, or MBCT. These also are the same questions Emily asked you during the grounding exercise. Keep in mind that the idea is not for you to actually ask students these questions, but rather to use the questions as an internal guide toward connecting with students. Okay, so let's start. The first step is simply noticing your students for signs that they are struggling. Sometimes it's obvious, like if they are screaming or crying or running out of the room. Sometimes it's less obvious, like if their bodies are hunched over or closed off. And sometimes it's very hard to tell, like if they're masking. If you sense that a student is struggling and needs support, you should first determine who's the right person to offer that support. You should only apply this model for students with whom you can feel calm and grounded and with whom you can create a connection of safety. Whether you can be calm and grounded is going to really impact whether they can calm and ground themselves. That's the idea behind co-regulation. And as I said earlier, just making this connection is so important to give students a sense of social safety. But if you can't offer that grounding and safety for a student, that's okay. Just find a trusted adult who can. If you can create that safe space, the next step is to figure out what they're feeling. We can't know what someone else is feeling, so we will have to reflect on what the student can communicate to us. Keep in mind that students may struggle to communicate their feelings because they may not even understand their own feelings themselves. That's what we call interception, the ability to understand and feel our own body. And many people who are chronically struggling have trouble with interception. So it's important to listen to what they are communicating about their feelings directly, as well as what they're communicating indirectly. The next question is, what is their belief? Our feelings are not directly caused by our environment. In between the environment and our feelings are beliefs. Using a neurodiversity lens, we can see that everyone's beliefs are different. That is how we can start to explain how two people can feel different things in the same environment. For instance, you are all in a school environment right now. I feel safe in a school environment, but I feel anxious in other environments. Interestingly, many of us even share a belief that we would not choose to spend our time in a school building if we had the choice. And even still, we likely all feel differently. That's because we're not talking about just one belief, but many. What beliefs lead me to feeling discomfort? 
I believe that being with people my own age is hard for me. I like being with kids and, or older adults. This chain of beliefs is called a belief system. And at the core of all belief systems is a belief that we are more safe or less safe somewhere. That's the belief we need to uncover. The fourth question is, how does their experience of the world inform that belief? So for my example, we would ask, what is it about the way I experience the world that makes being with people my own age uncomfortable? Coming up with ideas of what to say is challenging and causes me discomfort. If I feel that discomfort, I believe I'm unsafe. This is my experience and I wouldn't expect anyone to see or understand that. But what I do ask is that you believe me and honor that my unsafe feeling is valid, even if you can't feel it too. That is what everyone deserves, including your students. My name is Jessica Toslowski, and I am currently a fourth grade teacher at Emerald. I am in my 11th year of being an elementary school teacher. And so we have one more question. What do students need? One word, safety. When your students believe they are unsafe, they need safety. How do you give them safety? Well, we've done all the hard work of figuring out what is making them feel unsafe, so all we have to do now is address that thing. But remember, there are two kinds of safety physical safety and social safety. You can help with their physical safety by trying to change things in their environment. This can help with their sensory experience. You can help with their social safety by trying to change things like expectations, relationship dynamics, or attitudes, or maybe a combination of those things, or even all of those things. And when you consider what to change, I ask that you not think of this as an accommodation. In other words, a special exception you're making for that particular student. Instead, remember that other students are likely feeling the same way without showing it, and so when you listen to one student, the change you make may actually benefit everyone. So those are the five steps. Now let's go ahead and run through them with a hypothetical example. There's a stack of papers on each of your tables, or for virtual participants, you can view materials in the Schoology folder. Please go ahead and take a look at the worksheet. These are worksheets with the same five questions we've been looking at. OK, so here's the example. You and I are close friends, and we are having dinner at a restaurant. We are both talkative and laughing and having a great time. Do you remember that example of neurodiversity that Emily gave earlier about spicy foods level one through five? Well, the server comes over and explains that every dish tonight is going to be at a spicy level three, and then gives us more time to order. After that, you continue to be chatty and engaging, but I have become quieter and reserved. Okay, I've described what happened. Now let's go through the questions. I'll fill in answers on the chart on the screen as we go along, and you can do the same on your paper worksheets. Question one. What did I do in that story that may have hinted that something is wrong? I became quieter and reserved after the interaction with the server. How about you? What was your behavior after the interaction? You remained chatty and engaged. Question 1B. Is there a space of safety in our relationship to connect and communicate? The answer is yes. I told you that we are close friends. That is the kind of relationship that should have trust and safety. Question 2. What am I feeling? Well, you don't know. So you could ask me something like, hey, I noticed that you got quieter. Is something coming up for you? And I would say, yes, I'm feeling apprehensive. How about you? How are you feeling? Let's go with happy. Question three, what is my belief? Just like my feelings, you can't know the beliefs that are leading to my feelings. So you could ask me something like, why do you think you started feeling apprehensive? I might say something like, the server said all the food was spicy level three, and I don't like spicy level three food. And that would inform you that I believe that spicy level three food does not taste good. And you can see how that belief would make me feel unsafe because we are hardwired to believe that foods that don't taste good are unsafe. What about you? What's your belief? That spicy level three food does taste good. And I can see how that would make you feel safe because we are hardwired to feel safe when we believe we are or will be well fed. Question four, how does my experience of the world inform my belief? How would you learn about that? Well, you could ask me something like, is that too strong a spiciness for you? Of course, it's possible that it's the opposite. Maybe it's not spicy enough for me, which underscores the point that you don't want to assume anything. I say, yes, it is too strong of a spiciness for me. Now you've learned that I have a higher sensitivity to spicy food than you, and also higher than what is regarded by the restaurant as typical. What about you? How does your experience of the world inform your belief? Your taste sensitivity matches what the restaurant regards as typical. Question five. Let's start with what you need. It seems that the environment is aligned with your way of experiencing the world, so what you need is to stay in the restaurant and have something to eat. How about what do I need? It's clear that the environment is not aligned with my way of experiencing the world, so what should happen next? I'll give you four options to choose from. A. 
I need to eat, but everyone should be able to eat spicy level 3 food, so I need to stay with you and learn how to eat spicy level 3 food. B. I need to eat, and so it's up to me to find a different restaurant that serves spicy level 1 food, but the closest spicy level 1 restaurant is in Denver, and all I have is a bicycle, so I have to ride my bike down to Denver while you get to stay and eat. C. I need to eat, and so the restaurant makes me a special spicy level 1 meal, but they bring out your meal in 10 minutes and don't finish making mine until an hour later, and it's served in a to-go container. D. I need the restaurant that we went to to be a restaurant that, as a standard practice, offers meals at all spicy levels so that you and I can both eat what tastes good to each of us together. Who says A? B? C? D? Yes, of course it's D. A is an example of assimilation. If I want to be with you, then I have to be like you. B is an example of exclusion, the contrapositive. If I want to be like myself, then I have to do that somewhere else. C is an example of integration. I can be myself with you, but only as a special exception to the standard. And D is an example of inclusion or belonging, setting the standard that everyone gets to be themselves together. You may also notice that whereas A and B put the burden on me to deal with a misaligned environment, choices C and D put the responsibility of adapting on the environment. This is important. Forcing people or students to deal with misaligned environments is unjust and also simply doesn't work. Rather, it's the environment that has to adjust to the people. But D is still better than C because, whereas C is akin to thinking through the lens of accommodation or making a special exception for one person, D is an example of universal design. The idea that our environments should be designed in ways that enable everyone to access them equally and on their own terms. So it's not like there should be a spicy restaurant with bland food accommodations or a bland restaurant with spicy food accommodations. But instead, restaurants should just be restaurants that cater to everyone. And the same is true for schools. That is a good note to end on, so let's recap what we covered today. First, we learned that neurodiversity means that everyone experiences the world in a different way, not better or worse, just differently, and that neurodiversity includes everyone. Then we learned about the five-step model to support our students. Question one, what are they doing and can you establish a connection based on trust and safety? Again, if you can't, that's okay, just find someone who can. Question two, what are they feeling? Question three, what is their belief? Do they believe they are safe or unsafe? Question four, how does their experience of the world inform their belief? And question five, what do they need? As you take this with you, I encourage you to notice times that you might want to start with question one, what are they doing? And skip all the way to question five, what do they need? Without asking the middle questions. Our brains are always trying to be efficient, and so we commonly try to skip the hard questions. But when we do that, we fill in the gap with assumptions. And in this case, those assumptions are likely to be that other people believe what we believe, feel safe as we feel safe, and experience the world as we do, which we know now is not true. And the last thing I'll leave you with is be patient with yourselves. Give yourselves grace, give yourselves compassion, because not only do you deserve that, but you will also be modeling it for your students so that they learn to give themselves patience, grace, and compassion too. That way, even if we do feel unsafe, instead of feeling fear, shame, and guilt, we may instead find some self-love. Thank you all again for being here today.